together. Father God, we come today and just uh, praise you today and we just thank you so much for blessing each and every one of us. Father, we ask you now to uh, be with our service today. Father, just help us to uh, glorify you today in everything that's said, everything that's done today, Father. We know that there are many on our heart today, Father, that are sick, Father, that are battling diseases, that are battling sickness, Father. And we're just going to ask you to touch them today, Father, and just be with them and just help them today. Help us, Father, and just open us up to what you have for us. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.
there is coming a day when no heartache shall come no more clouds in the sky no more tears to dim the eye all is peace forevermore on that happy golden shore what a day glorious day that will be what a day that will be when my jesus i shall see and i look upon his face the one who saved me by his grace when he takes me by the hand and leads me through the promised land what a day glorious day that will be there will be no sorrow there no more burdens to bear no more sickness no pain no more parting over there and forever i will be with the one who died for me what a day glorious day that will be what a day that will be when my jesus i shall see and i look upon his face the one who saved me by his grace when he takes me by the hand and leads me through the promised land what a day glorious day that will be i love this right here there will be no sorrow there no more burdens to bear think about it no more sickness no pain no more parting over there and forever i will be with the one who died for me what a day glorious day that will be what a day my jesus i shall see and i look upon his face the one who saved me by his grace when he takes me by the hand and leads me through the promised land what a day glorious day that will be what a day glorious day that will be amen shackled by your head be burdened Then the hand of Jesus touched me, and now I am no longer the same. He touched me. joy the 
that floods my soul Something happened And now I know He touched me and made Just a little homesick That's what this funny feeling is I'm thinking about a place called home That's where I really want to go I'm ready now to go place where I belong That's why I call it home I'm just a little homesick I'm older now It's plain to see this world's been so blessed to me Not a lot that makes me want to stay I'm making plans to move someday My Savior's who I want to see My family's there to welcome me just a few more miles to go Until I make it home I'm just a little homesick I'm just a little homesick That's what this funny feeling is I'm thinking that a place called home to 
go I'm ready now to go back home My Savior comes and takes me home To the place where I belong That's why I call it home I'm just a little homesick I'm just a little homesick that's what this funny feeling is I'm thinking about a place called home That's where I really want to go I'm ready now to go back home My Savior comes and takes me home to the place where I belong That's why I call it home I'm just a little homesick To the place where I belong That's why I call it home I'm just a little homesick I don't care, turn your Bibles to Luke chapter 10 We'll be looking at Luke chapter 10, and we're actually going to look at verses 25 through 37 this morning, but I'm not going to read all of that, but we're going to be continuing on with our little series on neighbors, and this morning we're going to take it a little bit further. We're going to um, go a little bit further down the road. We've been talking the last couple of weeks about um, all the different qualities that have to be within us to be good neighbors. And now, this morning, we're going to look at the um, who our neighbor actually is. And we're going to do that in the context of Jesus' parable of the Good Samaritan. And you all, a lot of you probably have heard that um, parable before, probably have um, read it several times. But we're going to look at it. Hopefully, uh, you'll learn something new. And we'll look at it a little bit differently this morning. But again, we're going to be in Luke chapter 10, verses 25 through 29 is what I'm going to be reading this morning. If you found that in your Bibles, I'd invite you to stand with me if you're able to. And uh, we're just going to um, work through it this morning and see where the Lord leads us, if that's all right with you all. But it says here in Luke chapter 10, verse 25, it says, On one occasion an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. It's not smart to test Jesus, by the way. But it says, On one occasion an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, What must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law, Jesus replied. How do you read it? And he answered, Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your strength, with all of your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. So Jesus answers him. He says, You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Hmm, good question. Pray with me this morning. Father God, we come today. We thank you again. I thank you for our singing this morning, Father. And I just thank you for everyone's obedience to you today and all that we do. And I'm just going to ask you now to uh, open our ears and open our eyes and unstop our hearts today, Father. And just help us to uh, absorb and apply your word to our lives. We thank you today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Thank you all for standing. So... This parable itself, it's going to start out just like um, a lot of the different parables that Jesus uh, teaches in. And, and a lot of the times Jesus is trying to teach people, but it's because someone has, has tried to challenge him or challenge some aspect of what he was teaching. And this one's really no different. And uh, he's approached uh, this time by, it says, an expert in the law. And these experts in the law, they're talking about the Jewish law and what we would call the Old Testament and all the commandments and all the things that the Jewish practice. Um, he was an expert at it. He had spent his whole life dedicated to it, studying it and, and learning it. He knew it inside and out, frontwards, backwards, upside down, every which way you can know it. This guy knew it. He was an expert in it. And, and so the Bible says again in verse 25, on one occasion an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. And like I said when I was reading, really, um, it's not very wise to test Jesus. It's not, especially not wise to test the one that is is the Word because He is the one that developed the 
the Word, and He is the one that the Word is about. So and this expert's going to stand up. He's going to challenge Jesus. And, and even though it's not really a wise thing to do, I think a lot of times we try to do that ourselves. And we, we do it in the context of not wanting to do the things that God's told us to do or doing the things that God's told us not to do. And it's just really, it's a challenge uh, of, of towards God of what we're really doing here. Because when God says, don't do it, and we do it anyway, we're challenging God's authority. And really, that's all that this expert here or, or lawyer or whatever you want to call him is doing. He's challenging and testing Jesus and testing his authority. And he asked him, he says, Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? That's a good question. That's actually an excellent question that he asks there, but he's not doing it in the context of the way he needs to be doing it because if he's really sincere about it, Jesus would have told him exactly what he needed to do to inherit eternal life. And, and I'll, I'll tell you something. This is a good question that every single one of us need to ask ourselves. It's, it, hopefully, everybody here has asked that question and have received the answer to that question of what we need to do to inherit eternal life. But if you're asking that question this morning, I'm going to tell you what you need to do to inherit eternal life. Now I'm going to tell you using the Word of God. Um, ever, anybody ever heard of the Philippian jailer out of Acts chapter 16? Y'all heard of him? Yeah, that's one of my favorite stories in the entire Bible. That was actually the story that the Sunday school teacher down in Houston, Mississippi. I was in Houston, Mississippi. It was hot too. You think it's warm up here sometimes? You go down to uh, down to the southern part of Mississippi, getting close to uh, down on the Gulf Coast. It is hot down there. Um, but we were down there. I was down there for the summer visiting my grandparents and the Sunday school teacher. She was reading this story, and this was when the Lord spoke to me. And because the Philippian jailer, he asked the question. He said, "What must I do to be saved? What must I do?" And I realized, hey, I got to do something about this. You know, the Holy Spirit brought that to me. And this is the response that he received, though. He says, they were, this is Acts 16, 31. It says, they replied, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. You and your household. Basically, through you and your witness, your entire household will be saved. And, he, and so, it is believe in the Lord Jesus. That's how we're saved. That's how we inherit eternal life. And Paul, he goes on, he teaches about this in Romans chapter 10 as well. This is what we call the Roman road. It's says that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, guess what's going to happen? You will be saved. It says, for it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it's with your mouth that you confess and are saved. And so if you want to just kind of take that in a nutshell, salvation comes through our, our faith in Jesus Christ. That's the only way. It is in faith in Jesus and Jesus alone. Paul writes in Ephesians, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and it's not from yourself. It is the gift of God. You ain't got to pay for it. Do you know that? It ain't going to cost you nothing. You can't earn it. You know, Brother Bowen told the story this morning in Sunday school about the guy that gave a bunch of money to all these different churches when he died, trying to buy his way into heaven. You can't buy it. It ain't for sale. It's free. It's a gift that you accept. It's a gift of God that you accept. And it says, um, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. It is not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by work, so that nobody can boast about it. So, really, this morning, uh, with just that first little section here, I want you to consider right now, I would encourage you, strongly encourage you to consider where you stand with God right this minute, right this moment, where are you at with God. If you left this world right now, where would you go? Where would you go? Think about it. The Holy Spirit will tell you. And I'm going to tell you another thing. If the Holy Spirit's telling you to do something, do it. Don't wait. Don't wait till tomorrow, next week. Don't wait till the end of the service. You be obedient to the Holy Spirit this morning. Because that's what matters. That's what matters. It's the Holy Spirit. Maybe the Holy Spirit's telling you you need to come and ask for forgiveness for something. Maybe the Holy Spirit's telling you you need to come and ask direction for something. I don't know what it is. But I'm telling you, be obedient. Be willing to do what the Holy Spirit tells you to do. Listen to the Holy Spirit. Because our expert in the law that we're talking about this morning, he wasn't a very good listener. 
He wasn't listening to what the Holy Spirit was teaching. He wasn't listening to what Jesus was trying to tell him. He was more concerned about trying to find loopholes, trying to trip Jesus up, and, and trying to find a way around the only plan of salvation. That's all he was doing. Like I said, he was an expert at this. He knew what he was doing. He was trying to bait him. He was trying to set Jesus up. He knew the law. He knew everything about the law. He had studied it his whole life. And you can tell he's trying to butter him up a little bit because the first thing he says is teacher. Oh, great teacher. Oh, Jesus, you're so great. Oh, I love you so much. You're such a good teacher. Just trying to butter him up is all he's trying to do. And you think Jesus was convinced by that? You think Jesus was moved by his buttering up? No, no. But he says, oh, great teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And I think he kind of knew what Jesus was going to respond. He, he knew that there's going to be one of two things. Either Jesus was going to respond in something that he could use the law against Jesus, because he was, he was going to find some contradiction in what Jesus said, or, he, or Jesus was going to do what Jesus did and, t- and use the law itself, and he thought he could outsmart Jesus because he thought he knew so much about everything. So Jesus asked him, this is verse 26, What is written in the law? How do you read it? Or what's written in there? How do you interpret what it says? What do you think it is? So I'm sure the guy, I can picture him, he's probably like, Oh, I got you now. I got you now. You're getting in my territory now. I know all about it. I've learned every word in it. You know, atheists, they, they know the Bible pretty good. Did you all know that? Most atheists, they, they can probably quote you uh, scripture, passage, verse, everything, a lot of things because they dedicate their lives to trying to disprove God. So just knowing it, knowing what it says, is not going to get you anywhere. You've got to know how to apply it to your life and what it means in your life. So you can go home and you can study this book all you want, but if you don't use it for anything... It's just like studying another book. I don't know. There used to be some books under here. Um, just, here's a magazine. Look. Here, I got something for you. If you don't apply the Bible, if you just go home and read it, take this home and read it. It'll do you just about as much good. It may do you better good. This is holiness today. Uh, check in your personal inventory. Huh. Well, that may, that may, I may have to read that sometime. <laughs> oh, look what else fell out. <laughs> You never know what's underneath here. (laughs) But he asks, he says, well, what's written in the law? What do you read about it? How do you interpret it? What do you say it's got to say? So the guy answers him. He says, love the Lord your God, love your heart, your soul, your, your, your strength, and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Sounds familiar, don't it? You know... We, we read this all the time in the context of the New Testament. We think this is something brand new that Jesus just introduced in the New Testament. It's not. It's not. Now what Jesus did was He took the command of God and put it in its proper perspective. It was always there. He, Jesus elevated it to where it needed to be. That's why He points it out in the New Testament. Did you all know that there are 613 Jewish laws? I wasn't for sure how many. I, looked, I, looked, I didn't look up each one of them, but I looked up to see how many there were. 613 Jewish laws. Think about that. How many did God give Moses? Ten. So subtract ten from 613, what do you get? 603. So that means that the Jews added 603 laws to the original ten because they couldn't follow the ten. So they had to add 603 more. Now, what kind of sense does that make? But you all know why they did that? Why they added all these laws? It's because they were good at following rules instead of following God. They were good at following rules rather than following God. They were more concerned about the rules and they became consumed with which ones they thought were more important than the other ones. What it, and the way, way this kind of worked out is they would kind of look at them and the ones that are kind of easy to follow or the ones that, that fit what they wanted to do, oh, they, well, you must follow this law. But the ones that were kind of hard or the ones that didn't fit their narrative or their version of things, 
It's like, well, we'll move that one down to the bottom of the list. It's still a law, but if you don't, if you don't follow that one, as long as you follow this one up here, yeah, you're all right. You think we ever do that? It sounds a whole lot like the 21st century church. Become more concerned about rules and regulations and following people and following what the rules say as opposed to following what God says. And opposed to following what God says. And we like rules. As a society, the church borrowed this from society, by the way, because rules are good. I'm not going to say rules are bad because it, 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 there's order. It makes life more orderly. It tells us how to act, how not to act. So those things are important, but they have to be in their proper perspective. But what we'll do is, and each denomination is, does this, they'll have their own statements of what they believe, they'll have their own rule books of what they believe, a whole big bunch of them of what they believe. And what they'll do is they'll use that to replace God and to replace God's Word. Well, I've just shut my computer down, so this is going to get fun now. (laughs) They'll use the rules to replace God and to replace God's Word. And we have a bad habit of doing the same thing. What we do, the Church of the Nazarene, I don't know if you all have ever seen our our little manual that, that we have, but that thing is about, now it's small, it's, you know, it's small and square, but it is about, um... Oh, I don't know. I think the last count it was 900 and some odd pages. And the writing is not very big either. It's a little bitty. That thing's about that thick. So, why is that important? Why do we have all that? Because somewhere down the line they thought it was important because people couldn't follow what was in here. So they felt like they had to add things. And every denomination is the same way. But the problem is we've become so adapted to following these rules that we forget God comes first. Following God comes first. Following God's law is first. And we'll follow the rules but not the law or not God. So I want to ask you, what's more important to you? Following God or following the rules that we set? Because the point behind that is this. When we are so dedicated to following the rules, we get, set in the mi- we get trapped in the mindset that every Christian has to look like us, every Christian has to act like us, they have to dress like us. And, and if they don't, then there's something wrong with them. And we begin to start passing judgment on them. Well, here's a news flash. Every Christian don't look the same, don't act the same, don't dress the same. They don't. You know, I could take this little tie off, and it wouldn't change one thing about my relationship with God. Y'all know that? Here, I'll prove it. I'll take the thing off. I don't like it no way, to be honest with you. Here. Hold on. Let's put that there so y'all can still hear me. Look. Watch. It's not magic. I promise. Look. It does not change one simple thing. Not a thing. So we need to quit worrying about these things and quit worrying about impressions, quit worrying about what other people think and start following God and start being obedient to God and start doing what God is telling us to do and start obeying God's commands and not, and not worrying so much about impressions and what things look like. Because God comes first. And God is going to make every one of us different and tell us to do things differently than everybody else. And we may not like what He he tells us to do sometimes. You know that? We may not like it. But it don't matter. Because if God says do it, God trumps everything that we say anyway. So, this old boy, he answered the question right, which is kind of surprising he answered him. He says, Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your strength, with all of your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. So he, he gave him the right answer. And this is what Jesus says. Listen to what Jesus says. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. You know, Jesus didn't just leave it at, Well, good, you learned it and you know what it says. He says, Do it then. 
Go out and do it. Put your money where your mouth is, basically. Be a doer of the Word and not just a hearer of it. You know, like I said, we can learn it. We can know exactly what the Word says. But if we don't do it, it's pointless. We're called to be doers of the Word. But instead, he wanted to argue. He wanted to debate. He wanted to try to weasel out of everything. And I'll just be honest, we do the same thing sometimes. We'll try to get out of it. But but here it is, verse 29. He says, he wanted to justify himself. So he asked Jesus, who is my neighbor? Who is my neighbor, Jesus? Is it that person down the street that, that made me mad? That mowed all the grass over into my yard? Is that my neighbor? Is it the person that took the last box of cereal at Walmart? Is that my neighbor? Want to run me clean off the road last week? Are they my neighbor too? Who is it, Jesus? Is it just other Christians? Just other people that look like us, act like us, dress like us? Other people that go to our church? Other people that, that, that live in our community? Who's our neighbor? He don't really care who the neighbor is. He just wants to try to, try to trip Jesus up to get him to say something that's wrong. He's not interested in it. He just wants to justify his own inaction and his own inability to follow God. He's trying to find a way out instead of just being obedient to God and doing what God's called him to do. And We spend a lot of time working to get out of just being obedient to God. We'll work ourselves to death to get out of just obeying God. So, now at this point I picture Jesus kind of just rolling his eyes a little bit. Now, it's sitting here in the Bible. It's just the way I picture it. You're just kind of thinking, oh, boy, here we go again. Here we got another one. So he tells him. He gives him a parable here. And you all are familiar with this probably. It says, In reply, Jesus said, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he fell into the hands of robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. It says, A priest happened to be going down to the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too a Levite, when he came to the place, saw him and passed by on the other side. It says, A Samaritan, as he traveled, came to where the man was, and he saw him and took pity on him. He took pity on him. Now, you all have probably heard this preached a thousand different ways from Sunday. You know, I don't know, this may be just like one or maybe different. I don't know. But here's the, here's the story. This man's going, he's going down the road. He's on, I guess he's on his way home. The assumption is he's a Jew and he runs into some trouble on the way. He runs into some people that are robbing him. They take all of his money, beat him, take his clothes, and leave him, leave him for dead out there on the side of the road. Just leave him there for dead. So, this guy's in bad shape. Ain't nobody got to help him. Ain't, you know, he's just laying there. He's probably going to die. So, but, a priest comes along. A man of God. The representative of the church. The representative of the Lord. He comes along. Yeah, he's going to help him, ain't he? No. No. Doesn't lift a finger. Because he's more concerned about himself than he is at Poor guy laying there on the side of the road half dead. He ain't going to get his hands dirty. He ain't going to get involved. He's got too many important things to take care of. So he passes on the other side. Hmm. A little while later, don't say how much longer. The Levite comes by. Now the Levites, they're the ones that take care of the church. They're the ones that, they're the congregation, I guess. They make sure everything runs, make sure everything's taken care of. These are God's people. Surely they'll help him, or this guy will help. Nope. See, he has an image to uphold. He can't be seen with that. He can't be ceremonially unclean. What would other people say? What would other people think? How would other people respond? What would they say about our temple if we let people like that, if we interact with them? Y'all see the point? 
And then a Samaritan comes by. Now the thing about the Samaritans is Jews don't like them. The other Jews, they don't like them. They consider them unclean. Call them things like dogs. Call them half-breeds. Have done nothing but run them down their entire life. And if anybody has a reason to be angry, it would be the Samaritan. If anybody has a reason just to walk on by, it would be the Samaritan. But he's different than these other people. It says he takes pity on him and he helps him. You know why? Because God's law wasn't just something he learned. It was something that was written on his heart. It was something that was in his heart. And when he saw somebody that needed something... God spoke to him and he responded and didn't care what other people said, didn't care what other people thought. He didn't care what the impression was. He saw somebody that needed help and he went and helped them. And if we want to be called the children of God, we want to be called God's people, we need to have the same attitude. We don't need to worry about, oh, the impression. We don't have to be the, the big church, the rich church, this church. Oh, you all hear it all. You all have heard it all. We need to be the church that people come to when they need help. And I'll tell you, I, I, am, I, I, am, I am impressed with this church. It's a small church, but you all do that. You all help people. But if we ever get to the place to where we're like these other two and act like that, then we're in a bad spot. Because the problem's not with these other is not with the Samaritan or with the guy that's half dead. The problem's with us. Because see, the church, the only thing it is are the people within it. And the church is going to act that way if the people act that way. So we have to decide which kind we want to be. And I hope that we never change. Because if we do, you won't see me here. And I would encourage every one of you to walk out the door too. Because that's not God's church. That's not God's people. That's just a bunch of people just meeting and playing a part, playing a role. But, so the Samaritan, he helped him. He did what was needed. And then, it says, uh, this is, I'm going to pick up verse 34. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring oil and wine on it. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him into an inn and took care of him. The next day he took out two silver coins and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return I will reimburse you for any extra expense that you may have. So not only that did he take care of him then, he, he, he took care of him long term. He made sure he had what he needed. He said, I'll be back when I come back. I'll take care of it. You see, it goes back to what James told us. Uh, you know, when somebody comes to you when they have a need, he says, don't just say, oh, I'll pray for you and send them on their way. Meet their need and pray for them. Do what you can. Help people. Be a representative of Jesus. Because that's what we're called to be. And Jesus asked him. He says, which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell in the hands of robbers? And the expert of the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. And Jesus told him, go and do likewise. Go and do likewise. You think it's any different for us? See, the guy asked, his question was, who's my neighbor? You know what Jesus' response was? Everybody. And if you find somebody in need, help them. Go and do likewise. Stand with me if you don't care. You don't care to come get a song together for us? I know we've covered a lot of ground pretty quickly. But I think that we have a lot of people here that have a lot of different needs this morning. And maybe you're here and you, you need to come into a relationship with Jesus Christ. You can do that today. All you have to do is be obedient. Maybe you need to come and renew your relationship with God. You can come and do that too. Or maybe you need, you've realized, hey, I've been a hearer of the word, but not a doer. 
Won't you come and ask God to help you with that? Or maybe, just maybe, it's something that wasn't even covered today, but the Holy Spirit spoke to you about something. I don't know what it is. Really? Unless you say something, it's none of my business what it is. That's between you and God. But you owe it to yourself to be obedient to God. So if the Lord's laid anything on your heart this morning, I would encourage you to come and put it on His altar. All right, let's pray. Father God, we come today and I thank you again and praise you for this time that you've given us to come out into your house. I ask you this morning, Father, to continue to be with us all and help us all, Father, and just to be with the many that are sick, Father, and just the many that are just struggling today, Father. I ask you to touch Ralph today, Father, and just help him and just to be with the whole family, Father. And I, we just thank you for touching Jack and touching the many others, Father. We ask you now today to continue to be with us and go before us, prepare our paths, Father, and help us to always be responsive to you. We thank you in Jesus' precious name. Amen.